Yeah, welcome everybody uh, to our talk today within the Design++ speaker series uh, provided to you by the Design++ initiative of ETH Zurich. Uh, my name is Michael Kraus and I'm happy to be your host today. Uh, it is my special pleasure to also welcome our guest and lecturer, uh, Ms. Alisa Andersek, who is joining us today. Before I introduce you to our speaker and her talk, let me shortly provide some background information on our new YouTube channel, where you can find all the videos of this speaker series. You can see the link here. The Design Speaker uh, Series is a recurring event where we will provide information uh, on upcoming events in due time via email, our homepage, or the YouTube channel. At the moment, uh, the Design++ Plus Plus initiative uh, is uh, a collection of professors from architecture, civil engineering, and computer science from ETH Zurich, uh, which are all involved in this Design++ Plus Plus initiative. And for running the business, so to say, there is three leading postdocs responsible at the moment, which you can see here. So my colleagues, uh, Daniele, Romana, and uh, me. And uh, yeah, we uh, will have another postdoc now in December starting uh, who is with us. Uh, doing the work here together with the professors. And in case you're interested in uh, the future of AI, machine learning, and XR in the AC industry, uh, so just reach out to us. Uh, you can contact us via email uh, or phone or in person, which is a bit hard at the moment due to COVID. Uh, and we would be uh, happy to discuss any ideas or projects with you. Having said that on the background for the Design++ Plus Plus initiative and the speaker series. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker of today. Uh, it is Dr. Alisa Andrasek, who is joining us today from the RMIT University in Australia. Um, Alisa is an architect, academic, and innovator. And as I said before, she is professor of design innovation technologies at RMIT uh, in Australia. She is also founder of Biosync and co-founder of uh, Bloom Games and AI Build. Uh, in her work, she introduced concepts of a renewed log logical core of architecture, high resolution design for complexity and the aesthetics of unseen. Prior of joining RMIT, she held the position of director of DPRO Architectural Design and Research Laboratory Wonder Lab at the UCL Bartlett, focusing on computational design, AI and robotic constructability. Uh, furthermore, Andrea's uh, work, uh, Andrea Sek's work has also been exhibited and resides in permanent collections, including the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the New Museum in New York, and the NGV in Melbourne, and a number of Biennals. Uh, I also recommend to have a look at her homepage, which is shown here. And uh, so there is no further words from my side. Uh, I will hand over to you now, Elisa, the stage is Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for um, invitation. Um, I'm very always um, uh, very happy to visit ETH. This is the first time I'm visiting it uh, virtually. Last time I gave a, a lecture there was in November 2019. That was also the last time I was in Europe before this crisis, so over a year now. Um, and I always really enjoy visiting uh, because of the level of research, which I think is the top in the world in terms of uh, uh, fabrication, constructability that we see in, in design and architecture. So perhaps uh, without further ado, I will share my screen now um, and initiate the lecture. So I will just start because uh, um, I would like to show quite a lot of material um, this evening or rather more early morning in Europe. Um, and also, um, I'm actually today I decided to show some of the uh, some of the work in progress as well, uh, not necessarily so much retrospective work, but really the some of the latest uh, research we are working on. Um, so um, as, as uh, Michael pointed out, uh, I'm a professor at RMIT and in, in the past uh, I've been doing research and, and developing uh, research programs at uh, UCL at the Bartlett in London uh, at the Architectural Association and also Columbia University amongst other places. 
So um, my practice always operates uh, uh, with incorporating a practice and um, uh, research, academic research, um, and always looking into um, uh, cutting edge technologies and how we bring them uh, back into design and architecture. So the question that I started with when I started my practice, uh, well now almost two decades ago, was uh, how do we address complexity, increasing complexity of the built environments? Okay, so I will continue that then. Yeah, sure. uh, so complexity was very important concern for me and I was wondering how to really address it. So. Uh, one uh, aspect uh, that, uh, of complex systems that I noticed was that uh, resolution at which nature builds or rather grow, grows, accumulates, decants is many orders of scale higher than the, than the resolution of the current building systems. And the same can be observed in the current uh, technology. Um, and um, I was very interested in computation. That was the kind of focus that I uh, decided very early on to uh, to be the key um, uh, uh, connective hinge for, for my design work. And uh, of course, uh, uh, a quick quote here by Daniel Dennett, uh, what Turing gave us um, is a way of thinking about in a disciplined way and taking seriously phenomena that have trillions of uh, moving parts. So this increase in computational power in, in uh, volumes of computation and also increase in, in av availability of data uh, in the last decade and, and specifically last five years uh, with the introduction of, of uh, parallel computing and, and, and the kind of NVIDIA chips, et cetera, allows us, uh, allowed us to do completely new work uh, or new kind of work uh, that was never possible before. Uh, this can be especially tracked, for instance, in the development of artificial intelligence that had a very long uh, AI winter. Uh, but uh, in the last few years, because of this availability of high volumes of computation, suddenly we see lots of uh, uh, new results. And so in this world that is uh, increasingly, increasingly converted in, in, in information and this into information, we see that in so many examples. So availability of big data, in, in other words, uh, for the first time in history, we can uh, approach uh, a design synthesis um, uh, at a very high resolution and complexity. Why is this important? Because it starts to resonate features of complex systems um, and, and, and starts answering that initial question that I posed, how do we uh, design for complexity? So there is this convergence of exponential technologies and uh, increased volumes of computation that allows us to do that. Um, and I always said if, if architecture could be attributed one superpower, and I actually see that it has uh, at least two, but uh, the main one would be the power of complex synthesis amongst the myriad of agencies. This is historically um, a task of architecture because it always brings these multiple agencies um, uh, together, whether it's uh, current modes of production, economy, uh, zeitgeist, thinking of the time, uh, current. Uh, uh, technology, etc. So it always brings it all, synthesize it into, uh, through the agency of design. Um, so, so I coined some terms such as the fabric of architecture, which I actually borrowed from uh, quantum physics, um, uh, uh, physicists talking about fabric of the universe, for instance. And, um, but in, in architecture, the, con the constellation of these interlaced contingencies involve the information of architecture because we see lots of advanced research in various domains of design, architecture, engineering, such as, for instance, what you guys at ETH are really, as I said, the best in the world, which is this kind of research into new forms of fabrication, constructability. Um, uh, but the, so there are these kind of components, but I was wondering always, uh, how do we actually bring it into the synthesis? Because sometimes in academia, and I did that as well extensively, we develop these experiments, but they don't reach uh, larger applications in the world out there. And architecture still has a very small agency uh, in application. So uh, in, with, within this kind of idea of synthesis, but also uh, high resolution, I was also interested in, in new kinds of materialities and aesthetics that have been possible um, and that were never accessible before, because now we can render certain invisible forces visible. We can co-design our projects directly with physics at a very high resolution. 
Um, we, um, in this case, I won't be going into this project, but in many examples, we worked with simulation of computational physics in order to develop, um, uh, for instance, uh, through big data sample, through, through various uh, uh, factors of, of the site and of these simulations, develop different models of, of uh, high resolution structures or poly resolution structures, um, et cetera. So this kind of trillions of moving parts of resolution that we find in nature, suddenly we are able to think about buildings uh, um, at, at such uh, uh, intricacy as well. So um, at some point I made this uh, alternative proposal, especially when Rem Kolhas was uh, uh, curating uh, uh, Venice Biennale uh, with this idea of fundamentals, which was a fantastic topic, but looking into a largely modernism still and what are the fundamentals of, of modernist space, as you can see this element, such as ceiling, wall, roof, door, etc. That's the resolution of architecture that, that uh, is still currently uh, uh, predominantly is used. But alternative proposal to reoriginate architecture's fundamental, uh, fundamentals at this point in, in time uh, is by introducing the physics of fric friction, gravity, viscosity, and massive volumes of data and code as the acute fundamentals of the new kind of architecture at increased resolution. Uh, so that has many consequences. And in order to do that, and also to treat um, building ecology and design ecology truly as an ecology, um, I was thinking very early in my career, uh, how do I do that explicitly, not just metaphorically. So um, the idea of, of working on logical core of architecture, which I truly believe exists historically, but um, now it's accelerated with the new computational tools. So I focused on, on the fabric of information because it was a connective hinge between all these different facets, whether it's uh, fabrication, how do we build, whether it's how do we uh, um, read the, the big data from the site uh, and all these other orders of scale. If we want this kind of true ecological synthesis, uh, that kind of information tissue is basically at the core of it. And uh, even my practice that I started in 2001, that, is, uh, that I entitled BioThing, uh, didn't have anything to do really with biomimetics as, as uh, people often think. But uh, I actually looked into information uh, transfer in biological models. So biology for me was the most complex model of information transfer I was able to find. Uh, and um, <clears throat> instead of centralized linear functions, there is this prevalence of distributed uh, neighborhood-based computing, which to me was a very interesting idea that I was striving towards because of ideas of ecology and uh, adaptation. So that's how the, basically the name of my practice came about. And also, um, the, um, very early on in, in maybe 2001 or two, I started talking about um, discreteness uh, in algorithms, in information structures. Um, at the time, there was another model, which um, is um, uh, something that, that uh, Mario Carpo wrote in, in, in uh, uh, first digital turn and then second digital uh, Term, the book that uh, um, basically our work is on, on the cover, our research work um, uh, of uh, uh, Mario's book on the second di digital turn. And um, this kind of shift from the continuum to the discrete model. On this for 20 years now, uh, because I was looking into this kind of um, uh, true algorithmic structures, how we go um, all the time towards more and more discretized models of information. Why? Because if you have a, a kind of linear function, uh, let's say uh, the whole uh, movement in architecture, such as parametricism um, stemmed out of it, um, you, you are, um, you are for, for instance, using something like a wave function or a gradient, linear gradient fun function, uh, where, where basically um, that kind of mathematical function cannot talk to anything outside of itself. While, for instance, uh, fast forward um, in 2004, when I started using multi-agent systems, for instance, algorithm for the first time with the emergence of processing uh, software environment, um, suddenly you, you have uh, these discrete agents who can uh, 
talk to each other kind of like uh, this this example is now very uh, well known but uh, like a biological swarm for instance or, or, or school of fish so if you have a school of fish uh, there is no not one dominant fish but there is a kind of local signaling and self-organization uh, so this kind of models interested me because of the adaptation um, and because of ability to absorb information and data from outside, uh, which then took years uh, uh, to very recently where we are finally able to do that, to really connect this kind of synthetic uh, tissue of um, um, generative design that I've been working on for 20 years now, um, to actually um, to this uh, external data uh, uh, that we find in, in a kind of um, in the environments and also what what mario stresses out and which i often talk about as well is um, uh, this kind of shift uh, towards big data towards discretization uh, it's not only um, a computational but it also uh, i mean it's computational but it also um it also uh, is um is showing in, in many other fields because uh, uh, we see that uh, in particularly in science where the new knowledge is derived by myriad of correlations rather than, than uh, cause effect relationships so um, when we could actually access matter at that kind of resolution when we could simulate it uh, at the resolution of particles of dust through, through physics uh, simulations for instance how matter behaves uh, we can work with material science or we can program um, uh, through, through computational instruments and, and through, for instance, robotic fabrication. We can program the position of, of material, uh, also, for instance, 3D printing as well, all these uh, new technologies of fabrication. Uh, we can program the position of every particle of dust, you can say. That is the building block now, the physics, the particles of dust, uh, particular matter. Um, that is much higher resolution than, for instance, even uh, what was already high resolution. Architects um, never particularly work with it, but such as, for instance, uh, brick. And of course, at ETH, we have the most uh, successful uh, robotic brick experiments as well. But uh, with my friends, uh, Gramatio Kohler there. But um, anyways, um, um, if you look at something like a bone in, in biological organisms, let's say our bones, and we look at them under the microscope, we see that nature does not waste material. Every collagen fiber is exactly uh, 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 happening under pressure, or under pure, pure computing of physics, um, computing uh, certain um, um, states. So, so in the bottom of your leg, for instance, um, your, your uh, bone tissue is denser, so it can carry more weight, etc. So that kind of high resolution, um, because obviously in, in uh, nature information is cheap uh, and material is expensive, it, it doesn't waste it. Those principles we would use um, uh, very early on as input for, for generating designs. In this case, this is just an intro exercise that we did uh, with students at the Bartlett years ago now uh, with multi-agent systems um, using agents to um, uh, work around the body uh, and uh, grow the structure and then uh, using uh, voxelization, mathematical models of, of uh, uh, multi-resolution voxels, of course high resolution around the body for more comfort or sometimes more density in structure um, and then developing this kind of proto uh, proto chunks of architecture, proto structures. Now, of course, if we want to build it fabricated, uh, uh, we, we also need to, for instance, program the robot, uh, robotic uh, paths to, to navigate this territory. Um, there are many examples of this that we've done in the past. In this case, again, that the intro chair exercise with students where they're splashing uh, the body basically with a liquid uh, doing a, 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 a uh, simulation of, of, of fluid dynamics around the body and finding, not taking some existing chair um, uh, shape, but uh, really uh, uh, splashing the imaginary impossible liquid, I would say, because the physics sometimes are impossible as well. Uh, uh, they're used uh, in a, as designer physics um, uh, for form finding. And then series of other algorithms transferring it to uh, this type of fabrication uh, part and that uh, the Bartlett actually we didn't uh, at the time have uh, uh, 
a proper nozzle so students actually developed their own which was uh, very interesting uh, uh, quite impressive that they managed to do that and then uh, these chairs they, they were actually somewhat usable as well um, very uh, bouncy and, and sort of adapting to the body um, so what was interesting to me here is uh, incredibly small amount of material but incredible strength because you distribute matter as like the bone does uh, and you get this for instance three and a half uh, a meters tall column but uh, incredibly strong even though it's fabricated in a very a weak plastic material and then of course when you're fabricating with robots there, there are lots of material tolerances you encounter these uh, uh, constraints of matter this kind of uh, hard resistance of matter and slowness of matter um, so you always have to work with that and for me this was never an obstacle. I always took it as just uh, another layer of information uh, for the system and then always developing new, for instance, in this case with AI Build, which is a, a, a startup that I help co-found uh, with some of my former students and researchers from my lab, Wonder Lab in London. So we looked into deep learning in order to train the robot how to uh, recognize what the node is. So, so because this, um, when you're printing lattice structures, um, and, and especially this kind of insane resolution, the, uh, the uh, errors uh, quickly accumulate. So the robot needs to see what it's doing and needs to make these on the spot decisions. What you model is not really or simulate is not really what's happening in a real time fabrication. This is another quick example. Uh, actually, this is the one from the cover of Mario's book. Uh, where we use Perlin noise, so even more chaotic uh, algorithm, uh, noisy one. But imagine if we have these type of structures, um, if we could actually uh, 3D print and very soon we will be able to, um, uh, let's say, columns or parts of structures at this kind of resolution. So your uh, design detail or your building detail looks uh, something like this, almost uh, like a skin under a microscope. Um, so uh, this, uh, this fabric can then, um, can then develop a structure that is much more efficient, but also uh, does multiple things such as filter light, uh, perhaps air as well, uh, etc. So working with material science, we can imagine a very near future. We can at the moment simulate and design it speculatively um, where, where uh, structures are, are much lighter. Of course, uh, buildings currently are at least 10 times heavier than the laws of physics tells us they could be and, and the structures of nature tells us they could be. So there is lots of work for us to, to do. Uh, of course, we know that uh, CO2 emissions are very high in construction and, and the buildings and the cities. So, so all of that is always on my mind when, when we work on these things. Um, also, in this case, uh, a printing part even more complex because it, it's unstructured data generated through noise. So you need to train the algorithm to, uh, for pathfinding to really find uh, pattern recognize uh, the kind of most efficient ways of, of, of printing. So I won't talk too much about this because this is older work and this is something I'm just mentioning because I know that you guys are working with fabrication a lot and I'm stressing especially these information systems uh, within that territory. Um, as a kind of one of the results of this research uh, at uh, UCLA de Bartlett was also Croatian National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale that we designed uh, and then fabricated with AI Build, this uh, startup that um, came out of, of my research lab. Um, where, well, initially I, I, I will just briefly show you the pavilion just so you know what I'm talking about. This is a structure um, uh, at, in Arsenale. Um, two years ago and initially I was um, I designed something like this this is a field looking from below um, and um, uh, at this kind of swirling uh, spiraling almost like stormy columns um, lattice columns and um, this was half a million voxels but due to the time of uh, that we had with two robots uh, with AI build uh, we were only able to print 40,000 voxels so uh, this project turned into that and, and always interesting moments when, when you have to, again, work with constraints. He told us uh, everything in, in um, the universe is in theory computable given enough of time and resources. But of course, especially when we are working with matter, 
you don't have infinite time, you don't have infinite resources. This was also interesting, this fabric, because it only had four states, uh, and yet it managed to capture this kind of uh, agent-based action of a, a swarm ascending up and, and swirling these columns. Um, another, um, another result of that kind of twist is also that the columns were stronger, of course, uh, because uh, there was that behavior embedded into it. Incredibly intricate, again, incredibly weak um, uh, material, People at the Biennale were trying to shake it and destabilize it. It was very strong, of course, nothing happened. Um, this structure was only 75 kilograms. It was covering um, eight by eight meters in plan and, and over three meters, uh, nearly three and a half meters uh, height. So in uh, the lightest possible structure we can imagine. So can we build lighter structures? I think yes, uh, we'd uh, build more with less material and more information. Um, we also currently doing a research into metal 3D printed structures uh, with uh, uh, here in Australia uh, with cold spraying of metal, which is a very interesting method where um, uh, molecules are being ejected at a supersonic speed. And um, the, the prospect in theory of, of this technology, why, uh, why I'm very excited about it, is uh, that you could uh, potentially print structures that have different densities at a molecular level. So you can, for instance, print with titanium, but parts of your structure could be heavier and stronger versus the other ones uh, uh, less strength and lighter. Or you can, you can mix molecules of different metals and metal alloys, etc. So this is the resolution of structures that I envision and I'm working on um, that I think we will uh, we will soon have access to. Um, and so, um, so we did lots of speculative also, obviously based on, on that, of various data, speculative projects with students. And this was, um, I wanted to stress this because recently we, we, there is a lots of uh, uh, talk about discrete in architecture and there are different approaches. Uh, um, um, for instance, from my uh, former team in, in London, uh, Gilles Retzin, Manali Menes Garcia, and, and others. Um, they were also former students. But uh, um, for me, when I, when I started talking about discrete, it was really about information and what it ena enables uh, uh, through algorithmic, uh, through computational fabric. However, uh, since I was teaching, um, I was actually the first design studio at Columbia University teaching uh, code uh, within design studio in 2001. So uh, um, teaching students to write code is not easy because uh, often architectural students don't have this type of brain for um, uh, mathematical functions or code. Uh, 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 often we have students that are very good designers, very strong visually, but not so strong analytically. It's rare to find, uh, there are of course many talented uh, people around, but it's rare to find both strengths. So oh, um, in 2001, I, I, I designed this um, a methodological exercise uh, uh, for the beginning of my studio teaching, uh, which was uh, how do we physically compute. We have a discrete uh, building block. And, um, and for instance, this is um, the one that is well known now. It's been in over 30 countries. Um, we designed it for the London Olympics in 2012. It was blue. Um, this is, for instance, one of the kind of fields that we build um, at the Olympics. But whenever people play with this system, they get different results. And yet it's all the same component. And um, I don't have it in this, um, in this uh, presentation, but this component only has three connecting points. So it's extremely simple, it's banal. Basically, you can see it here. Um, and so, uh, but these three connection points give you virtually infinite number of, of, of possibilities. And whenever I've seen, and I've seen thousands of people playing with this uh, uh, urban game, as we called it, or, or later it became an interactive toy, um, kind of like organic Lego, um, no one ever gets the same results. So, so it really works with your intuition and, and, and uh, uh, it gives us this lesson that I, I, I wanted to teach students very early on that one of the main principles of complexity, small input, very large output, that's what you're going for. So small input, but uh, emergent uh, complex outputs. Um, and recently, two, three years ago at RMIT, we, we uh, repeated some of these exercises with, with some of these uh, um, discrete building blocks. And this one is very simple again. 
but uh, it's a bit more complicated but, uh, than Bloom because it has uh, more uh, possibilities of connection. It has actually 78, uh, if I remember cor correctly, um, um, combinatorics of, of connecting. Um, and so uh, initially we were working on this uh, with the idea that we will be training uh, robots to assemble it. So, so to train a robotic brain to, to work with some of these um, things. Uh, but students in the end worked with it uh, through um, AR with, with, a, with a kind of uh, uh, having a, only a map of a mass of something that, uh, uh, that is for instance a wall or, or a building chunk and then improvising within that because at that time we were not able to compute these 78 states and what is the exact connection at every point in time. So I thought this was an interesting computational problem. Um, and we worked, uh, we took that kind of simple model and then um, uh, we tested it on various applications. And this is also a power that I was talking about uh, already 20 years ago, really, uh, power of computation uh, and computational design. You develop one behavior in one project and then uh, you can instantiate it into another and another project and, and it, it always mutates with the design process and, and it can be used for many different applications and many different orders of scale, which again uh, resonates with this idea of, of build a complex build ecology. So this was a studio that we did actually during the lockdown, the first online studio, um, and this was intensive studio, only six weeks, but um, um, under this uh, idea of complex city and um, thinking about the idea of high density because we, we still need to build uh, so many uh, uh, population on, on earth is still growing and, and we need to build more cities, we, we need to build uh, more. However, when we, uh, and, and also I was looking into uh, lots of scientific theories um, about how we uh, preserve other species and, and, and how to work on a planetary scale in a way with, with, I always say planet is my main client. So how do we address some of these planetary issues? So could we build at high density yet high quality if we use more science into conceiving and construction of buildings? So this is not for me new topic. I, I, in my deep past, this is now, I don't know which year was this even, uh, 2011. Um, I won't be showing this project, but that's just showing quickly um, uh, this little tool that we wrote at the time for multi-agent systems um, in Rhino, where, where we basically, um, I was thinking about this, uh, um, it was a competition for, for uh, a site in Dubrovnik, in my home country, in Croatia. And um, a part of this site had this kind of uh, urban villas. And I wanted them to really have great views in front uh, of on the, on the old city and on the sea. Um, I also wanted to pick up on certain cultures of, of, of living in Mediterranean, which is uh, people love um, um, external um, uh, spaces. They, they love basically um, uh, uh, patios, terraces, uh, etc., uh, balconies. So I wanted to amplify that. And, and, um, and then I thought, okay, uh, historically looking at architecture, uh, uh, Peter Eisenman's uh, work with section uh, was extremely exciting at some points uh, uh, in, in his uh, deconstruction period. Um, so this shredded fabric, multi-layered shredded fabric uh, was another gene that we inputted into behavior of agents. So this, what was uh, interesting about agents and this relates to this idea of discretization and more discrete, simpler building blocks, but uh, the ones that can actually adapt and read information from outside. So these agents were looking at the, the data from the solar, they were looking at the data from the views. They, uh, uh, we also embedded uh, these behavioral aspects that produce this kind of shredded fabric. Um, and so these were some of the, the results of, of, of that. But then the same code was applied in the next competition for a small tower in actually the, the site next door in Montenegro. Um, same issues there. There was an issue of um, same conditions, but in a different building type, typology. So suddenly you plug the same behavior again into this. So you get um, uh, one of the main ideas here was how do we get more skin? Because, you know, most buildings just have a flat facade and uh, 
And so it's, it's a very kind of uh, limited am amount of skin or let's say views or windows, exposure to the sun or exterior spaces that you can get from them. Uh, if you think about something like a complex, um, let's say complex geometry, such as geometries of fractals, where you have a point A to point B and you can connect point A to point B uh, with a straight line. Let's say if you're uh, flying by the airplane uh, from one city to another, or you can follow the coastline, such as for instance, UK, uh, a British uh, coastline that is incredibly intricate. So that line is much longer. Similar principle here, higher resolution, more facade, more kind of building skin. So, I started to think not only in these conditions where we see um, this insane density, but also even in a, in a normal towers, the typical towers we see in, a, uh, for instance, here in Melbourne, uh, architects working on towers. And I looked into, um, often into what kind of models, data structures they use, uh, not many, uh, we could say. Um, so I was wondering, can we, by using machine learning, artificial intelligence, by using big data, can we pack more data into this design search for high rising, high density fields and get more of this, uh, uh, let's say roof terraces more, um, because we know that the most valuable apartments in every high rising building are these penthouse apartments because they have roof terraces, because they have good views, etc. So can we, can we work with more data in, in the search for, for these conditions? And um, so at the moment, uh, for instance, one of my PhD candidates, uh, Joshua Lies, is working on this, um, looking into various models of machine learning uh, um, and, and looking into packing different uh, uh, data. So I don't have time to go into all the technicalities, but uh, even combinatorics of, for instance, the sizes of the apartments, and then um, um, typologies, and then uh, looking into some of these ideas of, of, of paths through, through plants or, or, for instance, exposure to daylight, to views, um, uh, to certain compartmentalization within apartments and, and within chunks of the building, and training certain AI models. And the ones we are choosing uh, at the moment, he's working uh, with, with three, um, starting on the fourth one uh, of machine learning, because these are complex problems when we come to the fabric of building and so much data, you cannot handle it with one, uh, with one logic. Uh, but uh, this kind of uh, competitive learning, but also the one that uh, can actually take mass of uh, various data and compress it uh, from this higher dimensional space. That's why I like voxel models, because in theory, mathematically, we can work with n dimensions. Uh, with voxel model and compressing it into lower dimensional space of architecture, you could say, um, and different instances of it. Um, so I'm, I'm just talking about it at the moment, theoretically, not going into too much detail, but um, imagining <clears throat> could we develop a higher resolution fabric of architecture for high density cities that is also higher quality and also democratize that quality for everyone. So it's not only 5% of penthouse apartments in the building that are good ones, but actually most of it or all of it is good, hopefully. Um, so with students, we also run this studio, uh, which, um, which will be exhibited actually at the Venice Biennale next year. Hopefully we finally have Biennale next year, uh, maybe virtually, but still these projects will be there. And um, given that we were all in a lockdown here in Melbourne, suddenly the green spaces became very important and also the idea of wilderness became very important. Suddenly, I live in central Melbourne, but there were more birds around uh, uh, in front of my window, my, my terrace here. So, um, so also thinking of, could we also challenge ourselves even more and um, develop a model where um, where wilderness and high density coexist in the same territory. So we were, we were, um, we were looking at a, a, a city in China, the, the new development of a, a city from scratch that needs to be developed in China. And we know that they are being developed very fast and built very fast. And trying to think, um, because this, uh, this site is on a beautiful green kind of site with lots of water bodies and forests, 
how can we preserve that while still um, answering this demand for, for high density? So students were then um, uh, looking into models of urban farming, also models of distributed um, kind of uh, ideas of Industry 4.0 and um, 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 somehow ideas of, of, of distributed manufacturing, uh, micro factories, uh, 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 where, where perhaps uh, the body of um, um, the dark body you see here in blue in the section of this uh, tower field, um, it's, it's uh, uh, this kind of dark factories where perhaps robotic or, or fabrication spaces are in that kind of dark uh, uh, belly of the, of the building while uh, humans are in the skin. So in this kind of very high resolution skin, humans and, and, and greenery basically, but even though lots of farming as well, uh, these students had uh, put in, in the dark spaces and we see someone like Rem Kohas, for instance, um, talking about some of these models of farming and, and, and about um, the, you usually see these type of buildings in the countryside, not in the cities, but uh, uh, can we bring this kind of uh, fabric, productive fabric uh, also in the city? So students did this uh, quick speculations and can every building also be an energy factory in this kind of distributed uh, models of energy production? Uh, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, uh, uh, hydrogen, etc., et can uh, every building or the city or a district become also an energy factory on the spot, uh, rather than uh, relying on this kind of uh, 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 big grids? So I'm just showing, I'm, I'm, I don't have time to go into all these uh, projects, but these are students' projects um, looking into uh, various computational infrastructures and, and, and uh, synthesizing them. For instance, this was a very large one, again, in China, uh, looking at the site uh, in a very high density city and looking at the various uh, models uh, of agents and voxelization and, and other kind of algorithmic layers uh, to try to envision or emerge with the extremely high density um, um, architectural fabric, but also the one that uh, incorporates uh, uh, green. So the green is creeping into the building and being woven into it. Uh, also the orientation of these units uh, um, responds to the uh, views around or responds to the um, physics. So it, it's almost like sculpting architecture uh, to data and then the designer goes into that design search space uh, um, um, that is highly informed and, and tries to pull out certain sequences. And these are crystallizing, these are very strange architectures that didn't quite crystallize yet. And really I'm showing you just the kind of raw research now, uh, current one. Uh, but it, it uh, uh, makes us also ask questions what architecture could be in those conditions. And in this case, Again, blending with the forest, uh, living in the wilderness, but also high density, how that can work. Um, exactly the same methodology, same algorithms uh, um, apply to entirely different problem. This was just a week long, uh, even five days uh, long workshop um, that we did for Digital Futures. That was this big event in China. And uh, we also included our, some of our RMIT students um, uh, into it. So uh, we were thinking about life supporting uh, uh, infrastructures on Mars, uh, just as a speculative problem. So thinking about these non-human architectures, again, at a very high density, if you're thinking about uh, batteries, um, uh, lithium batteries, or um, if you're thinking about solar panels or wind. So, so if we are going to somewhere like Mars, even though we took that provocation of Mars because it's so extreme, it has extreme physics, uh, um, et cetera. So, so we look, and also I, I absolutely love this, uh, always uh, Mars dunes, Mars landscapes. Um, and also there is a very large uh, database that NASA um, has posted where that we, we use for kind of machine learning, training of machine learning algorithms. Um, so how do we envision this kind of life supportive ar architectures? And it was, it was completely speculative. So seeding the light, life seeding um, uh, generation of energy. And you do that kind of extreme speculation. So five days with students, and then you start thinking about 
some other issues. Um, and I'll just quickly flip through those because again, so, so for instance, this kind of insane density, so Tesla batteries or, or some other technologies can we pack them uh, more efficiently than in just this, uh, what we see today, this kind of uh, very simplistic fields or cities even, cities or, or on, on Mars, or if not on Mars quite yet, then in the desert, can we build in, in this kind of extreme environments? Um, so these were speculations, but these speculations serve us um, uh, not only to evolve some of these computational and design tools, but also to think about uh, problems that we have now. And last December and January, before the, the pandemic even um, um, exploded uh, around the world, um, here in Australia, we had big fires. I mean, the country was burning. It was, uh, I never experienced, I experienced a war in my home country in Croatia. I experienced 9-11 in New York, but this was really impossible to breathe. The, the smoke was in the air in central Mel Melbourne where you, you, you couldn't, I mean, there, was, there were no fires here, but smoke was covering such huge areas that uh, it was impossible to breathe outside. Um, so, this made me think, I mean, it really felt, I didn't think even that uh, I will um, experience that in my lifetime, but it felt like end of days, the planet in peril, it was here. It was not in some sort of um, undefined future. And obviously the virus as well, uh, COVID-19 is, is a result of, of ecological crisis on the planet. So um, how, do we, how do we then design for this uh, condition of the post-Anthropocene? And I started looking into this, I, I was quite fascinated. I should have prepared more images for you guys um, of this, but if you Google, for instance, abandoned mining sites in Australia, of which there are 60,000 of them, over 60,000 of them, um, suddenly we have these um, incredible sites, which are usually in some sort of incredible already uh, natural environment. This one is especially interesting. It's a uh, Argyle diamond mine in um, Western Australia, in the north of the country, very hot, but uh, it was uh, uh, responsible for 90% of, of uh, production of pink diamond in the world. And it's closing, it's supposed to close this year. So these are these massive um, sites, just like a 700 meters height difference between the bottom and top. Um, it has beautiful lakes around. There are these events uh, where these uh, uh, desert flowers are blooming uh, uh, once a year. And so it's, it's uh, and then it has these machining imprints of, of mining, which to me uh, are very interesting. So thinking um, how we developed those. Um, so we were in, on Mars, but then we came back to Earth. We are looking at this site of the Taberan, the uh, uh, they're very different depending what, what the mining activity was. Some of them are very toxic, some of them are not so toxic, but uh, still um, the environment is destroyed and, and uh, uh, these barren mountains. Um, and then students started uh, uh, producing speculative designs for those. Um, initially, they still, when you, when you give that kind of task to students of architecture, they will try to develop um, inhabitation for, for humans. So initially they were looking to residential um, uh, developments on those sites. And um, this was one project which was actually site here in Victoria in Lilydale, which is, uh, which basically does make sense to be developed as residential because the developer is already developing it as such, but he's spending hundred million dollars to just fill the uh, pit, the mining pit, and then develop a conventional residential development on top of that. So again, the high resolution, how we access complex sites. So uh, here we worked with the ideas of, of adapting to the found condition and introducing certain cultures. Let's say if you're talking about green, then uh, a growth of, of al algae cultures and hydroponic farming um, and algae energy farming. Um, and, and, and those kind of productive structures, the farming structures are at the same time uh, generating this kind of public space for, for people in, in this area. And again, this insane density, not, um, not developing the whole pit, but just uh, one side of it, preserving the history of this mining activity um, uh, in the rest of it. Um, and really working with purely with data, data of solar, of wind, 
of different programmatic aspects and sculpting this uh, development. And, and you see these sites are incredibly powerful. Um, these imprints of, of, of machinic activities now abandoned. So what do we do with them? So, so we did many speculative proposals in the last few months. Um, and I'm really showing you undercooked work, work that is just happening now. Um, so of course you need to adapt to the geometry of these sites, to the solar, um, uh, to certain programmatic ideas. And the more we worked on them, the more I started thinking that in fact, we should focus on non-human architectures. So programs that are, for instance, um, energy generation um, and things like that. So again, sampling lots of data from the site, such as uh, uh, this kind of steepness of the site, solar, uh, wind data, for instance. Um, uh, and then um, again, something that literally was happening today, uh, 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 developing ideas of, of adaptive solar fields and uh, wind forests with these kind of wind towers, the new ones that are being developed without turbines. Um, because actually these sites make lots of sense for that kind of use because um, um, for instance, the lakes that are on those sites could be used for hydropower that works uh, in conjunction with solar. Australia, needless to say, has so much sun that it could be bottling it for half of the world um, in, in, in a kind of uh, hydrogen um, format. Uh, so we are looking into how we adapt uh, these different um, structures, uh, these different fields. Um, and, and, and how we nest them and, and, and regenerate these sites towards a different kind of economy, because we know that Australia very much, uh, and still to this day, uh, relies on fossil fuel economy. So how do we introduce a new type of economy into those sites? Um, and of course, Australia is not the only one. Uh, in the States, in Europe, we find even more of them. So. Um, so really thinking on that kind of uh, uh, scale of planetary problems and also thinking about, for instance, uh, other species. I think I'm out of time now, so I will stop. But um, um, in the fires in Australia, uh, so many species uh, uh, either died out or, or were uh, seriously damaged their habitats and, and their numbers. So really thinking how we design not only for humans, but for this kind of larger planetary systems and other species as well. So I will stop here, open the talk to discussion, uh, because I think I'm over time, but All hopefully right. have some questions. Thanks again for the nice presentation and the interesting uh, discussion. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed the talk and, and the questions. And uh, yeah, finally, I wanted to drive your attention to the upcoming talk in two weeks from now on 15th of December at 10 a.m. in the morning again. And uh, it is given by Professor Clayton Miller from uh, National University of uh, Singapore about the topic towards growing the data science community in the built environment. And uh, I'm really excited to also hear about uh, his efforts on getting students and uh, architects and engineers to code us. And yeah, now I can wish you a pleasant rest of the day from my side and the rest of the Design++ team.